A difficult non-conference schedule featuring the likes of Oregon, Montana, and Northern Arizona merely scratched the surface for South Dakota. How's everybody doing? I'm Jay Elson, and this is Coyote Quarter. Well, the bye week drew a very clear dividing line for USD, and as tough as things were over the season's opening month, the league slate will offer an eight-week grind unlike anything the Coyotes have experienced before. The Valley, which compiled an unbelievable 23-1 record against FCS opponents during non-conference play, had seven teams ranked in last week's coaches poll, including Southern Illinois, which came in at number 16. Saturday, Joe Glenn and company made the trek to Carbondale to take on the Salukis. Coyotes rocking their new road whites for their first ever meeting with SIU. And they were looking especially fresh on their opening possession. Ryan Sager, no trouble finding Aaron Ramsey. Hits his tight end for 25 yards on the second play from scrimmage and finds him again moments later. Two catches, 39 yards in a matter of six plays for Ramsey. The second set up a 26-yard field goal for Miles Bergner, his ninth consecutive make of the season. And it's 3-0 Yotes. SIU answers in a hurry. Tay Willis gets the Saluki started on the ensuing kickoff, one of the top returners in the Valley, and he shows why here. Willis takes it 75 yards. Bergner saves the touchdown, but gets flagged for a horse collar tackle. And after they walked off the half the distance to the goal, Malcolm Agnew scampers 11 yards for the touchdown on Southern Illinois' first play from scrimmage. And just like that, the Salukis jump in front 7-3. Coyotes get on the move again later in the first. Sager swings it out to Trevor Bama, and he's got some running room. 30 yards to the SIU 40. Sager continues to spread it around from there. Finds Eric Schuford this time. That goes for 19, and another USD first down. Unfortunately, it would all go for not. A few plays later, Coyotes elect to go for it on fourth and one from the Saluki six, but Bama gets stacked up behind the line. USD turns it over on downs. They trailed 7-3 after one. The Coyotes defense steps up in the second with the Salukis driving. Tyson Graham Jr. plays a little center field. The sophomore safety breaks up not one but two potential touchdown passes in the end zone to force Southern Illinois to settle for three and a 10-3 lead. Graham, by the way, also had a career-high 13 tackles. Southern Illinois looking to add to its advantage a couple minutes later, but Thomas Kinney's 52-yard attempt is knocked down by Drew Innings. Second block of the season for the Rapid City native, and the Yotes take over at their own 25. That was the spark the offense needed. Ensuing possession, Sager rolls left and threads the needle. 30-yard strike to Schuford. USD is in business, first and 10 at the SIU 16. Coyotes finish it off on the ground. Jasper Sanders caps the 12 play 75-yard drive with a five-yard touchdown run, his third of the year. And we go to the half with the score tied at 10. But the Salukis have owned the second half all season and Saturday was no exception. Third quarter, Mark Iannotti finds a wide open Michael Pruitt. 32-yard scoring strike made it 20 to 10. And the dogs never look back from there. Fourth quarter, Agnew adds a couple more touchdowns on the ground. He ran for 128 yards and three scores on the night as the Salukis roll 41 to 10. Southern Illinois put up 506 yards of total offense in this game, but 341 of that came in the second half. They've now outscored their opponents 114 to 13 over the third and fourth quarters this season. With the loss, the Coyotes dropped to two and three overall and 0 and one in the Valley. We just got a bounce bag. It's D-Days next weekend. Just completely forget about this game. You know, we, we hung with them for a half and we knew they were going to come out the second half and, and do what they do. That's what they've shown all season. We just weren't able to stop it. This one got away from the Coyotes quickly. Head coach Joe Glenn will give us his thoughts on the team's second half stumble in Carbondale after this. Coyote Corner on Midco Sports Network is presented by Billionado.com. And welcome back to Coyote Corner. Jay Elson down at the Dakota Dome in Vermilion, joined now by head coach of the University of South Dakota Coyotes, Joe Glenn. And Joe, uh, final score again on Saturday, uh, 41-10 in favor of Southern Illinois, your Missouri Valley Conference opener. And uh, 
one thing I think that goes without saying at this point, as strong as the Valley is this year, uh, there might be less room for error maybe than there's ever been, as, as tough as this league is year in and year out. Um, it's going to take a complete 60-minute effort for you to be successful at any point. No question. Uh, and you see it around the league. Mm -hmm. About every, every venue, uh, people got to go 60 minutes to win. And we played a 30-minute game about as clean as you can play and made a lot of good plays, offense, defense, special teams. Uh, and went in the locker room, having just scored a touchdown on a 75-yard drive, come out, got a little wind in our sail, and boom. I w no, can't really identify exactly mm -hmm. what happened, but they had the momentum. They seized it. They poured it on, and uh, we just couldn't recover. You stuck right with them in that first half, uh, and after Drew Eddings comes up, blocks his second field goal of the season, uh, the offense puts a great drive together just before the half. As you mentioned earlier, 12 plays, 75 yards. Jasper Sanders caps it off with a five-yard touchdown, and you had to be feeling okay with how things were going as you hit the locker room. Felt real good about it. For us to, to regroup and take a – a drive now 75 yards off a blocked field goal. Worked it right down the field. Mm -hmm. Quarterback draw, quarterback power, uh, some of those things mm -hmm. that our quarterback has done so well. Uh, and then Jasper Sanders followed some really keen blocking. Uh, great block by Andrew Schofield to put him in the end zone. And uh, heck, we're, we're smelling roses there a little bit. Uh, right before halftime with the 10-10 game on the road, um, things are looking up. Now, Southern Illinois has been a second-half team all season. You knew that going in. They'd outscored their opponents 83-13 to over the third and fourth quarters to this point in the season. Uh, the Saluki certainly held true to form to that on Saturday. They got the ball rolling with a field goal in their opening possession of the third quarter. Uh, just never stopped. No, it didn't. Uh, and I'm feeling down a little bit that we were that fragile. Uh, we just couldn't come up with a play on either side of the ball to, to get the momentum swung around. Uh, and then ultimately, we had the ball for three and a half minutes in the fourth quarter. They just hung on to it and mm -hmm. iced it and uh, didn't give us a chance to ever get back in the game. It's not going to get any easier this week. you got an ornery Northern Iowa team coming in here, fresh off a loss of their own. Uh, it's D-Day's. Big on so many levels for you this coming weekend. Yeah. Uh, at the end of practice uh, Sunday, uh, afternoon uh, I think the kids were bouncing back and starting to get their homecoming feeling coming on mm -hmm. and a lot of things to motivate us and uh, homecoming crowds sounds like it's going to be a sellout here in the dome so uh, we got to put it behind us and go forward and uh, we got another conference game against a old arch rival Northern Iowa. Yeah and as if homecoming weren't exciting enough it's also going to mark the official return of quarterback Kevin Earl. I know you've been waiting for this. The junior finally got his green light late last week, slated to start for you against the Panthers. Uh, what? Give it all the time off. What are you expecting, maybe hoping to see out of him on Saturday? Well, he's the Panther killer. If you'll <laughs> recall, a year ago, uh, he one of his first starts, he got in this game and he dialed it. And the mm -hmm. guy went lights out uh, and threw touchdown passes all over the place, drove us down in double overtime, threw a touchdown pass to win it scrambled ran through uh i hope he can pick up where he left off last year i have a feeling he's going to play a wonderful game all right well we're looking forward to seeing him out there again on saturday thanks for your time again this week joe Amen. uh coming up kevin earl will share his thoughts on his impending return and we go man to man with midgo sn analyst andre fields and saturday storylines that's next on coyote corner coyote corner on midco sports network is presented by billionado.com and welcome back. Well, several things contributed to South Dakota's Valley opening loss in Southern Illinois on Saturday. And here to talk about that, fresh off his own bye week, his <laughs> former USD defensive back and current Midco SN analyst Andre Fields. It's time for Saturday Storylines. Andre, this was a tale of two halves, certainly. One good, one bad for USD. The Coyotes stuck right with Southern Illinois, maybe even outplayed them over the game's first 30 minutes. Uh, but it was all Salukis after the break. And this is what the Salukis do. I mean, Jay, we mentioned it before. 114 to 13 is how they've outscored their opponents in the second half so far this year. So the Coyotes knew going in that this was going to be the one or lost in the second half. Obviously, it was lost for them, and a lot of that due to the fact that the Salukis just seemed to go to a different level mm -hmm. right around that fourth quarter. Execution probably part of it for Southern Illinois, but the other part just the fact the guys got tired because yeah. they were out th on the field uh, just far too long. Well, the Kyles had a couple of chances to put some more points on the board in the first half, 
but they couldn't make the plays. Ryan Sager overshot a couple of wide open receivers, and there was also a failed fourth down conversion deep in SIU territory. Could have been a very different game going into the half. Yeah, and you got to think, Coyotes had the momentum going into the half, but if you were able to put up those points, things that you have to do when you play a ranked team mm -hmm. on the road, you have to take advantage of all those opportunities if you really expect to put them on their heels and come out ahead in the end. Of course, it didn't happen, and then we see how the momentum did shift in the second half. And it's one thing to play well in the second half, quite another to play well from behind right. in the second half. Maybe exactly. Southern Illinois gets pressing. <laughs> a lot of things could have come out differently had they just been able to capitalize on some of those opportunities. Well, overall, the defense by the numbers had a pretty rough day, but uh, lost in all that was the play of safety Tyson Graham Jr., who we featured on the show here a couple of weeks ago. Graham all over the field on Saturday, finished with a career-high 13 tackles. He also broke up a couple potential touchdown passes in the end zone. It's looking more and more like USD has uncovered a pretty special talent here. Yeah, and it goes to say a lot about Tyson Graham himself coming in as a wide receiver, being asked to switch to the defense where you have to learn a whole new scheme. You go from being hit to starting to do the hitting, and mm -hmm. you wonder if they can actually make that transition. It seems like he's done a very, very good job of it. Very athletic. Mm -hmm. Very tough hitter. Yeah. And like you said, coming from wide receiver, you don't really see that too often, but it's a very good sign for the secondary. Absolutely, and he's got a couple years left. That's maybe the best Even part better. of it for, uh, for USD going forward. Well, the Kyles did get some good news uh, concerning another talented guy late last week. Quarterback Kevin Earl got that long-awaited yeah. green light from his surgeon. Nice. He served as the backup in Carbondale, but he'll be full go this weekend against UNI, and he is excited. <laughs> It doesn't feel 100%. It's not totally healed, but it's, it's able to sustain contact. And when I grip and throw a football, uh, I feel like I you know, have my velocity back ultimately. And I felt like that about a week ago. All right, he's excited. Joe Glenn is excited. As we heard Kevin just say there, the hand not quite 100% just yet. There's some pain, mm -hmm. uh, might be some rust. But overall, you have to think this could be a much needed shot in the arm. Uh, for this USD offense. Yeah, anytime you get your starter back, it's going to infuse a little bit of enthusiasm into the team. That's the one thing we'll be watching on Saturday, though, to see how does he throw the football. We know he's a huge arm quarterback, so mm -hmm. can he grip the ball good with that sore thumb? How much banging will the thumb take, and will that affect him? Mm -hmm. But overall, I mean, this was the game that he came in last year. They won in overtime, mm -hmm. so I know he's going to be fired up. It's D-Days, so that adrenaline might take away some of that pain. Yeah, Northern Iowa well aware of what Kevin yes, Earl can definitely. do based on that, what he did uh, down at Cedar Falls last year. Uh, so it, it, certainly everybody's excited to see what Kevin's yes. going to be able to do uh, this weekend. And it's D-Days, so That's that'll right. be exciting as well. All right, thanks a lot, Andre. The Coyotes will look to bounce back again Saturday against Northern Iowa. We'll preview the matchup with the Panthers next. Coyote Corner on Midco Sports Network is presented by Billionado.com. And welcome back. Well, number 21, Northern Iowa is up next for the Coyotes. And like USD, the Panthers are coming off a loss in their Valley opener, 20-19 at Indiana State, dropping them to 2-3 and three on the season. But don't let that record fool you. This team is loaded with talent. The Panthers feature 18 returning starters, including preseason All-American running back David Johnson and quarterback Sawyer Cole Morgan. Now, very few people have seen as much UNI football as longtime play-by-play -play man Gary Ryma, and he joins us now on the phone. Gary, heartbreaking loss last weekend for the Panthers. What went wrong in Terre Haute? I think the biggest thing is we continue to struggle in the red zone. We, we had that problem even in our season opener against Iowa. We got the ball in the red zone a couple of times and, and uh, couldn't come away with touchdowns. Uh, against Hawaii, we saw a similar fate there in a, in a three-point loss. And that red zone offense really uh, bit us again on Saturday. We were inside the 10-yard line three different times with – first and goal and came away with just one touchdown and a couple of field goals and that just that just isn't like the Panther offense and uh, I just think that that in a way kind of led to our demise on Saturday. Uh, considering that and what happened against USD last year probably not going to take the Panthers much to get up for this one. 
you know, this is the third year in a row the Panthers have started 0-1 in Valley play, and that doesn't set well with anybody. So I, I really think they're more looking at, you know, some of the things that are going on this year. There were such high hopes for this football team when the season kicked off that uh, this team, they, they just, you know, they got to look in the mirror and figure out what they got to do better, where they got to make some adjustments, and you hope it starts this Saturday on the road. But, but as you mentioned, with what happened a year ago, South Dakota's got an excellent football program, and they've done some good things. And the Panthers know they're in for another battle on on Saturday, and and it's going to be that way every Saturday in the Valley. One guy that played a major role in USD's win over UNI last year was quarterback Kevin Earl. He's going to be back in the lineup on Saturday. Do you expect the Panthers to try and do anything different against him this time around? You know, I don't know if you're going to see a whole lot of things different. I, I think there's some things they got to do better. And uh, man, he did a he did an unbelievable job from about the the five six minute of that third quarter to the end of regulation to overtime. I mean, he just he put his team on on his back and led him to that that really unbelievable come from behind win. That was an amazing job by that young man to to lead them to that that victory. All right, that again was the voice of Northern Iowa football, Gary Rima. Well, the Coyotes' chances for success this weekend will go up dramatically with another solid outing from the guys up front, a group that includes a pair of Iowa City natives, former high school rivals turned teammates. Alex Heider has that story next. Coyote Corner on Midco Sports Network is presented by BillionAuto.com. Now yeah, welcome back. Well, one of the more unheralded units on any football team is its offensive line. Though based on how central they are to everything an offense does, it's difficult to find a more important group on the field. For the University of South Dakota, the O-line has been a constant strength all season, led by a trio of returning starters and tackles Matt Huffer and Derek Chancellor and right guard Andrew Schofield. The other two spots in the line, center and left guard, have been manned by a pair of underclassmen who've gone from fierce high school rivals to the closest of teammates. For more on the two new Yotes in the trenches, here's Alex Heiner. Redshirt sophomore guard Niall Banks and redshirt freshman center Sam McLaren are in their first year playing alongside each other as starters on the University of South Dakota offensive line. But while this season marks the first time they've played together, it's by no means the only occasion that they've shared the same field. In their prep football days, Banks and McLaren were on opposite sides of one of Iowa's biggest high school football rivalries, with Banks featuring as an all-state lineman for Iowa City High and McLaren earning the same distinction for Iowa City West. The magnitude of their on-field meetings in high school wasn't lost on either at the time, and it hasn't dulled over the years. It's pretty big when you get into Iowa City. The, when the week of the game comes, it pretty much shuts a lot of stuff down and people start talking about it. It's a big deal. You'll remember it for a pretty long time. While McLaren's alma mater got the better of Banks's this fall, that was seldom the case when the two met up in high school. The year I won my senior year, that was the first time I think nine or ten years that we won. So I mean, pretty good that year, but uh, other than that, we've, we struggled a little bit. Especially my junior year, uh, Niall's team really kind of hammered us. I think they broke the state record for rushing yards. I think they had like almost 600 rushing yards. So. It was a long day. During the recruitment process, USD's offensive line coach Brett Harvey saw a number of measurable qualities in McLaren and Banks, but it was their on-field intangibles they showed at Iowa City that convinced him of their chance at succeeding on his squad. Some of the first things we talked to when we were talking to coaches on the recruiting process is how tough they are. I gotta have the tough guys that play for me and, and the toughness factor is a big, big deal for us. Yeah, and these guys fit that bill? Yeah, they do. Pretty proud of them. Now that Banks and McLaren have combined forces in Vermilion, the old City West feud still exists in small doses, but the respect each has for the other certainly dwarfs that. Now it definitely makes me elevate just just from the Iowa City High and City High, you know, just kind of rivalry deal. Is whatever Nile does, you know, I just want to be right there with him. It's definitely something I enjoy just looking to the left and knowing that uh, Nile's got my back and I got his. Sam could definitely move people. I mean, he squats almost top there on our whole team and. When we get going on the Uno's, Aces, all our uh, combo blocks with the guard, guard center, it's definitely, you know he's going to be pushing people with you. 
that people moving power is a big attribute, especially for a team that wants to establish the ground game first. We have a solid running game, that's the first step for us. If we can run the ball in the passing, we can throw the ball over people when they come in and they're trying to stop the run. Now that we're getting into conference, we're really going to try to put our footprint on it and say this is how Kyle football is. We're going to run it at you, we're going to pound you, and we're going to keep it going. While Banks, McLaren, and the rest of the O-line are some of the biggest, toughest guys on this USD team, that persona doesn't exactly carry over when they step off the field. We just try to have fun with it. I mean, when we get out, when we put the helmets on for those two hours, I mean, we like to flip the switch, obviously, but when we take them off, I mean, with Derek and Skull and Huff, I mean, even me and Nile, we just joke around with each other, just try to keep it light. We're just one big family on the O-line, and we just love playing with each other, and it's fun. It's that family mindset between two former rivals turned teammates that has the offensive line playing strong and the Yotes rising up together. You know, it's just the five of us out there and we're kind of playing like brothers and we're just, like Niall said, we're just trying to be nasty and I mean, move people when they don't want to be moved and I mean, really have each other's back and that's what we've been trying to do is, you know, you mess with Niall, you mess with me, you mess with Derek, you mess with all of us. Just kind of a brotherhood thing and that's what we take pride in. Well, that band of brothers up front have played well this season, but they'll have a big task on Saturday as they take on a Northern Iowa defense that has given up the fewest rushing yards in the conference and averages over three sacks a game, the second highest total in the Valley this year. However, those rankings might shift a bit by game's end if McLaren, Banks, and company have anything to say about it, Jay. All right, thanks, Alex. Again, South Dakota hosting number 21 Northern Iowa on Saturday afternoon in the 98th Dakota Days football game. Kickoff is slated for 3 p.m. at the Dome. I will be there, so if you can't make it yourself, you can always follow along on Twitter at Elson Midco SN. Now, between now and then, be sure to check out MidcoSN.com for the latest on USD football with the Coyote Corner video blog. Alex and I will take a closer look at the matchup with the Panthers in a post on Wednesday. All right, that is our time. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here next week for another episode of Kyle Corner.